I'm pleased to introduce Representative Wexton. I'm sure we have more than a few history majors joining us this afternoon. And Congresswoman Wexton was once a history major herself and graduated from the University of Maryland with honors. She has been serving the people of Northern Virginia for more than two decades as the prosecutor, attorney, advocate for abused children and state senator. During her years in the Virginia General Assembly, she passed more than 40 bipartisan bills. She was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in 2018. In Congress, Wexton serves on the powerful House Appropriations Committee, where she is responsible for securing funding for all of the government's spending programs. She is also a member of the House Budget Committee, which provides oversight of the legislative budget process. She is a founder of the Congressional Task Force on Digital Citizenship, which aims to help better equip Americans with tools and resources to use technology and engage online responsibly in an increasingly digital world. And in addition, she is a member of the Congressional Executive Commission on China, where she is working to combat human rights abuses. A native of the Washington DC area, she lives in Leesburg with her husband, two sons and two rescued Lab Labrador retrievers. About Maryland, she said, quote, without fail, I always stop by McKeldin Library to rub Testudo's nose before exams and it worked. Representative Wexton has a long list of distinctions and accomplishments. And as such, it's my pleasure this evening to present her with the Distinguished Terrapin Award. This award is our Hughes way of recognizing the outstanding contributions of our alumni and Representative Wexton is certainly well deserving of this honor. Her deep commitment to public service and leadership is an inspiration to us all. She is a strong and dedicated ambassador for the University of Maryland. And since this is an online event, unfortunately, I'm unable to present you directly with this award, but uh, we will make sure that you receive your award in the coming days. And please know that the enthusiasm with which we share this award is not dampened by the digital connections. So it's my pleasure to invite Congressman Wexton to share her thoughts and insights on our third night of access to alumni. Uh, please uh, welcome her virtually. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Thornton Dill. And it's wonderful to be with you all tonight. And I, can, I cannot believe that I'm here as a distinguished Terrapin. I just, if you had told me when I started at, at the University of Maryland that I would be coming back, decades later as a member of Congress and a distinguished Terrapin, I would have told you that you were absolutely insane because you know I was I was not I was not on this track when I when I was a student here at in Cal College Park. In fact, I was painfully shy. You know, I, I did not I did not even move into the dorms or anything like that. For my first year I commuted from my parents' house in Montgomery County and I took an assortment of classes. I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. In hindsight, I was one of those students who really would have benefited from a gap year to figure out what I wanted to do and figure out where my where my path lay. But uh, I went to I went to Maryland and I took a variety of classes. I took a lot of core classes for the humanities. I took I took calculus and chemistry, neither of which I were particularly I was particularly good at, and I just really did not excel academically in the beginning. I didn't go Greek because I was so afraid of having my peers judge me, and I was so shy. Um, so I ended up I ended up actually taking a year off when I would have had my sophomore year and I worked for a year. And I'm glad I did that because it really gave me a chance to put things in perspective. There's nothing like waiting tables for a year to make you realize that, that maybe maybe that degree is a good thing after all. So I went back to school and I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to study history because that was something that I was passionate about and that I really enjoyed. So some friends of mine and I got an apartment in a, in a Knox box. I, don't, I, I would imagine that they have torn all those down, but us, maybe the alumni here know them, know them well. Uh, apartments on, on Knox Road. It was a dump. It was, it was, it had, it had brooches and it was, it was lovely and it was just, but it was fun and it was close to everything. And we were able to walk to everything. 
Um, we were able to walk down to Purple Pizza and get pizza slices uh, late at night, which was great for us in college because it was a buck a slice. Um, but, you know, so I, I started studying history and I absolutely loved it. And one of the things that I had to do as a, uh, as a history major was take a speech class. Well, that was hard for me because I was so shy, but I absolutely loved that speech class. And it, it really, I think it did kind of change my life because I came out of my shell and I realized that I did like public speaking. I did like arguing. I did like being persuasive and, and I did like history. So, you know, after that, I, I spent a lot of time in the library. I really took my studies very seriously. As, as Dean Thornton Dill pointed out, I did stop and rub Testudo's nose every, every time before I had an exam. And I ended up doing quite well and graduating with honors. Um, and that was fantastic. But, but when it came time to graduate, I had my history degree and I did not take advantage of some of these wonderful alumni programs like Access to Alumni, which sounds fantastic. And frankly, I was looking at the list of alumni for the breakout sessions as you've got really great variety of people who are working within their majors in, in history and in communications and all kinds of fascinating careers. But I didn't know what I was gonna do. So I decided to go just get a temp job. And, uh, and I took the LSAT and I took a temp job and I ended up loving that too. I worked at a clinic called the Henry Jackson Foundation for the Advancement of Military Medicine. This was in 1991. This was a clinic that was co-housed, that was housed within the National Naval Medical Center, which is now, I think, Walter Reed Naval Center at Bethesda Naval Hospital. And we did all of the AIDS and HIV treatment for the military. And this was fascinating to me because this was at a, at a time that, that the military did not even have don't ask, don't tell. You know, these, these service members could be kicked out of the military for the very status of being homosexual. So it was really smart of the military to have this private foundation do all the research, do research protocols and treatment of these, of these young soldiers and sailors. And I really love that job. I love the people that I met there and, uh, and they wanted to keep me on you know, for a long time. But it was hard for me to see my friends start dying and that was not for me. So I knew that I wanted to continue to help people but I didn't wanna do it in the medical field because it was too hard for me to see my friends die. So I ended up applying to law schools. I'm sorry, I went, ended up going to law school in Virginia. I know that that's a big, that's a big betrayal <laughs> for people from Maryland, but I went to William & Mary for law school. I had already had the big college experience at Maryland and I loved it, but I knew I wanted a smaller school for law school. So I went to law school because I wanted to help people. And so I looked into public service. You know, I looked at being a public defender. I did a summer job there. I did a summer job with, a, with an immigration uh, firm called, or an immigration clinic called Ayuda Clinica Legal Latina. I got to use my Espanol with that, which was another, which was another wonderful benefit of, of my arts and humanities major. I discovered I had to take two years of a lang language. I took Spanish, y me encanta Espanol. And learning Spanish turned out to be one of the smartest things I ever did. Um, but, but then when I graduated from law school, you know, I ended up getting a job as a prosecutor in Loudoun County, and I loved that as well. You know, I really, it was fascinating to be able to help people in that capacity. I did a lot of domestic violence cases. Uh, I prosecuted everything from, from, uh, from traffic violations to murder, first degree murder, and I absolutely loved it. But after my second child was born, I decided to go into private practice and I continued my, my work in public service. You know, from there, I served as a guardian ad litem representing kids who were abused and neglected. I even served as a substitute judge in Loudoun's courts. And I was very content with that. Um, but then, you know, I started getting more involved in, in local politics and paying attention to what was happening in Richmond. And this was at a time when uh, the General Assembly in Richmond was, was controlled by Republicans. Uh, the governor was also a Republican and they decided to pass some laws that I didn't agree with. You know, they, they, passed, they passed very restrictive voter ID and voter suppression laws. Uh, they repealed one of the very few pieces of, of gun violence prevention legislation that we had in Virginia. Um, you know, the one handgun a month law. And this was also the time that you may recall if you grew up around here, uh, something about transvaginal ultrasounds going on in Virginia that made us the laughing stock nationally, but I didn't see anything funny about it. So when my state senator, Mark Herring, uh, ran for attorney general 
and his seat became vacant, I decided to run for his state Senate seat and uh, I won. Now, I had not really had a plan to go into politics. I, I always thought, you know, maybe I'd be a judge, maybe I, you know, I loved applying the law, but who am I to make the law? But when I, when, 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 when uh, Senator Herring was elected or when he was running for that office, I decided to go down to Richmond and take a look and see what it was about. And I couldn't believe it when I went down there because I didn't see anybody who looked like me, you know? There were very, very few women at that time certainly no women who had school-aged children, kids in the public schools, and here they were legislating all these things about young women in, in the public schools. So I thought maybe the, this place would work a little bit better and pass better laws if we had more people who look like the people that they're there to represent. Now, since that time, the Virginia General Assembly has become far more diverse than it was when I was there, which is a wonderful, fantastic thing, and you can tell from the legislation that has passed out of there. Um, but it turns out that I love, I love legislating, you know, I love working with stakeholders to figure out ways that government can, can work better for them. Um, you know, I love, I love crafting legislation. I love getting up and arguing for it. I love the give and take of the legislative process. And in Virginia, it was very different from Congress. But, you know, for me, when, when Donald Trump was elected president and I saw the same things happening nationally, that, that, I had, that I had objected to at the state level, I knew it was time to step up and run and I ran for Congress. Now, all of this was way outside my comfort zone, but because of the skills that I had gotten at the University of Maryland, because of that first speech class, I felt that I could do it and I did, and here I am. So now I'm in, in Congress and I still am helping people. I'm just doing it writ large. You know, I'm able to, to pass legislation that helps millions of people. I'm able through my constituent services to really help people. And, uh, and it is a new, new, new adventure for me. Um, now I serve on the Appropriations Committee, as, as was mentioned in my introduction. I serve on the Transportation Housing Subcommittee, uh, the State and Foreign Operations Committee Subcommittee, and most important for now, the, the uh, Legislative Branch Subcommittee, which oversees the, uh, the Capitol Police. So for me, that's a big deal because after January 6th, it became glaringly apparent a lot of the deficiencies within that organization and, and the supports that they need. So because of my experience as a prosecutor, I have a lot of, of, uh, of understanding of what the cops are going through. And one of, the, one of the initiatives I'm working on right now is trying to get the mental health services that are peer-to-peer -peer, uh, law enforcement specific. And so that's something that I'm, that I'm very, very, very focused on doing. Hopefully we'll be able to get that done in the near future. But again, I just try to help people. And as one of the representatives from the DC metro area, I feel very vested in making sure that, that the Capitol Police are taken care of because these are my constituents, many of them. So I had no expectation that I would be here one day as a member of Congress. It was not my expectation at all. You know, when I was that shy freshman in, in 1987, uh, I had no idea that I would be here one day, but I do credit it with the, with the skills that I learned at Maryland and with that first speech class that I had to take uh, that, that brought me out of my shell and made me realize that I could accomplish so much more. So I guess it's a long winded way of saying, don't worry if you haven't figured out what you wanted to be, what, what, be what you, when you grow up and what you wanna do when you grow up, because some of us are still figuring it out. But, but follow your, you know, find your why. Why do you want to do what you do? You know, is it because you want to help people? Is it because you want to make money? Is it because you want to be in the spotlight? You know, whatever it is, find your why and then go from there and just trust that the skills and then the, what you have learned, whether it's, whether it's your writing skills or your persuasion skills or communi communication skills, that they will serve you well as you move forward into your career, whatever career you may choose. So thank you so much for having me here today. I wish we could be together in person because I would love to meet all of you but maybe someday we will. And thank you so much. Enjoy your breakout sessions, everybody.